measles, mumps, rubella, hepatitis, pertussis. These are a handful of currently recommended and often required vaccinations. Most of us have had the wonderful experience of getting prodded by needles at the doctor's office, and it's not typically something we look forward to. But besides the minor pain associated with the shot, is there anything to be afraid of? It's undeniable that vaccination has had the positive effect of essentially eliminating smallpox and polio, but there are some people, particularly in the United States, that question the safety of the practice. So, just how safe are vaccines? Perhaps the most notable accusation, or at least the one supported by the most vocal minority, is that vaccines have the potential to cause autism. This concern originated from the publication of one study in the prestigious medical journal The Lancet in 1997. In this study, British surgeon Andrew Wakefield suggested that the MMR vaccine was increasing the likelihood of autism in British children. Upon further investigation, however, the paper was retracted from The Lancet after it was discovered that Wakefield committed serious procedural errors, ethical violations, and had received funding from groups opposed to vaccine manufacturers. The study was completely discredited, and Wakefield lost his medical license over the scandal. However, to the medical community's credit, they decided to take Wakefield's hypothesis seriously and conducted further studies. Not one of them found any link between the MMR vaccine and autism. Despite the clear falsification of data to achieve a predetermined result, the public was whipped into a frenzy by the report. In the following years, vaccination rates plummeted by 80% in the UK. Since then, this one study has been the root cause of severe damage not only to the public perception of the MMR vaccine, but also to the medical community as a whole. Money and resources that could have been spent investigating the true causes of autism were instead diverted to verify what medical journals later announced to be an elaborate fraud. In the years since Wakefield's study, the Center for Disease Control, the National Academy of Sciences, and the UK National Health Service have all confirmed that there is no link between vaccines and autism. Prominent hoaxes aside, most safety concerns regarding vaccines are based upon the claim that they contain toxic substances such as formaldehyde, mercury, and aluminum. It's certainly true that these chemicals are deadly in sufficient doses, but the amounts contained in FDA-approved vaccines are so minuscule it might surprise you. Take formaldehyde, for example. According to the CDC and the FDA, the human metabolic system produces formaldehyde at a higher rate than is contained in any vaccine. Just to be thorough, let's take a look at every ingredient that gives cautious people cause for concern. First we have thimerosal, an organic mercury-containing compound. Thimerosal has been used as a preservative in vaccines since the 1930s. Today, you'll only find it in flu shots. Such preservatives are necessary to prevent fungal or bacterial contamination. Part of the original vaccine autism scandal, in 1997, children were often administered three vaccines, which combined contained a higher level of mercury than the EPA recommended, though still below the FDA limit. The concern has led to years of research, which show that the type of mercury present in thimerosal, ethyl mercury, is different from methyl mercury, the type we find in fish and know to be dangerous in large amounts. Despite the fact that thimerosal is safe to use, its use was discontinued in 1999, with the exception of the flu shot, for which thimerosal-free alternatives are available. Next up is formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a tried-and-true ingredient used to deactivate viruses and detoxify bacterial toxins present in vaccines, which ensures they don't cause sickness upon injection. The concern here is that formaldehyde is classified as a carcinogen, and that strong, long-term exposure to the chemical has been known to cause certain types of cancer. As we heard earlier, formaldehyde is present in the human body in larger amounts than any vaccine contains. According to the FDA, the average newborn baby has 50 to 70 times more formaldehyde already circulating in its body than a single dose of any vaccine could introduce, and that amount increases as we get older. Aluminum is also present in vaccines in trace amounts. It's used as what's called an adjuvant. An adjuvant is simply a substance that strengthens the body's immune response to vaccination. This means that you need fewer doses of vaccines to build immunity. Aluminum concerns some parents because there is some evidence to suggest it can contribute to brain and bone disease in large doses. Frankly, there is absolutely no cause for alarm regarding aluminum. Why? Because for starters, it's the third most abundant naturally occurring element, after oxygen and silicon. You'll find trace amounts of aluminum in plants, soil, air, water, even breast milk. On average, a baby will ingest 7 milligrams of aluminum through breastfeeding within the first six months of its life. By contrast, all of the standard vaccines that baby receives during those same six months contain a total of about 4.4 milligrams. Aluminum has been used safely in vaccines for over 60 years with no evidence of any harmful effects. Next on our list is antibiotics. In some vaccines, antibiotics are used during the production process to avoid the risk of bacterial infection. The main concern here is that antibiotics may cause an allergic reaction in some patients. 
However, there really is no cause for concern because vaccine manufacturers select only the antibiotics with the smallest chance of adverse reaction. And since they're only used in the production stage, these antibiotics are reduced to negligible or even undetectable amounts in the finished vaccine. Not one single allergic reaction to a vaccine has ever been traced back to an antibiotic. Second to last, we have monosodium glutamate, or MSG. MSG is simply used as a preservative to prolong the shelf life of vaccines. This ingredient earned its bad reputation back in the 1960s after people began reporting nausea and headaches after eating food containing MSG. However, these effects are, without exception, short term and are not generally supported by scientific research. If you want to avoid MSG, make sure you ask at every single restaurant you visit because it's considered so safe that it's still routinely used as a flavor enhancer. And finally, the baddest ingredient on the block, gelatin. Gelatin is an effective preservative and stabilizer, which allows vaccines to function properly throughout their shelf life and under extreme temperature conditions. Of all the ingredients on our list, gelatin has the biggest claim to being dangerous. It's the largest source of allergic reactions in children. However, it's not much of a feat considering the harmlessness of the other ingredients, and even gelatin only causes a reaction in one out of every two million patients. That might sound scary until you consider the fact that your odds of being struck by lightning are one in 10,000. If you still don't like those odds and somehow manage to make it to the doctor's office without getting struck by lightning, there are gelatin-free alternatives available. That's the entire list of ingredients that are often used in anti-vaccination campaigns, and as we can see, they're really not so scary. Okay, but even if that's the case, even if vaccines are harmless, shouldn't people be allowed to choose whether or not to vaccinate their children? Short answer, no. For the longer answer, let's look at some statistics. In every major case of reduction in vaccination, there has followed a period of disease resurgence and mortality rate. In Stockholm in 1873, an anti-vax campaign motivated by religious objections and concerns of effectiveness and individual rights caused a drastic drop in vaccination rate, all the way down to about 40% versus around 90% in most of Sweden. Immediately following the drop, a major smallpox epidemic ravaged the city. This led to a resurgence in vaccination and, unsurprisingly, an end to the epidemic. In the UK during the 1970s, a claim was made that the vaccine for pertussis, or whooping cough, was largely ineffective. This proposal came from a well-known public health academic, which led to considerable media coverage and a subsequent drop in vaccination rates, from 81% to 31%. Several pertussis epidemics soon followed and caused the deaths of a number of unvaccinated children. The mainstream medical opinion remained strongly in favor of vaccination, and after getting the public back up to a healthy 90% vaccination rate, the epidemics faded. Even today, the United States is dealing with the consequences of past anti-vaccination campaigns. In 2000, measles was declared eliminated from the United States. Not one single internal case of measles had been reported in a full year. Then, in 2013, the CDC announced that the three largest outbreaks of measles that year had come not from abroad, but from groups of people who refused to vaccinate based upon religious or philosophical objections. 159 cases were reported in 2013, then the number quadrupled to 644 in 2014, after an influx of unvaccinated visitors from abroad infected unvaccinated Americans at Disneyland. Of the 288 victims during the first half of the year, 57% of them reported to be unvaccinated by choice. On July 2nd of 2015, the first confirmed death from measles in 12 years was recorded. You might be thinking, well, I vaccinate my children, why should I care? There are several reasons. First. Children have to be a certain age to receive many vaccinations, and before they reach that age, they are far more susceptible to infection. Compounding the problem is the fact that very young children already have relatively weak immune systems. So, babies born into a society with a large number of infected people have a drastically higher chance of getting the disease themselves, which can often lead to death. Infants aren't the only at-risk demographic. The elderly, as well as immunocompromised individuals, often lack the immune response required to fight such diseases. And finally, in some rare cases, it is possible for vaccinated people to contract diseases like the measles. During the Disneyland fiasco, six people who had received their MMR vaccines still managed to get infected. This only happens in cases where the individual's immune response was not strong enough to build up adequate antibodies to fight the disease and does not reflect poorly on the vaccine itself, as the MMR vaccine is regarded to be one of the most effective around the world. At the heart of the matter is simply human nature. We're conditioned to blow perceived danger out of proportion and minimize the risk of routine tasks. Take driving a car versus flying in an airplane. Driving is statistically far more dangerous than flying, but we do it every day without hesitation. And an alarming number of people drive while texting, but the minute we step into an airplane, we're certain it's going to crash. The same holds true for vaccines. 
some people see a list of potential side effects and immediately assume they'll suffer them all, while completely ignoring the fact that contracting the disease the vaccine prevents would be much, much more dangerous. The fact that anti-vaccination and disease outbreaks are so clearly linked should be enough evidence for people to protect themselves and their loved ones, but unfortunately that doesn't seem to be the case. When it comes down to it, the scientific consensus is as close to unanimous as you can possibly get, and it's apparent that vaccines do not cause autism, pose no major health risks, and offer a type of security from disease that nothing else can. Let's hope that humanity can learn from past mistakes and effectively work together to get everyone vaccinated and eradicate these preventable diseases once and for all. As this can be a sensitive subject for a lot of people, I've provided a comprehensive list of links, sources, and further reading in the description. Feel free to look them over for more information regarding the history of vaccination and disease prevention. If you enjoyed this video, remember to subscribe to keep up to date with the latest content, and leave a comment down below with your thoughts on the subject. You can watch my previous video by clicking here, or watch them all by clicking here. Don't forget to follow Second Thought on your favorite social media. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.